Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for another NetHope webinar. My name is Madeline No, and I'm from NetHope. And today our topic is optimize mobile data collection and improve service delivery. And we're very delighted to have today with us um, representatives from Dimagi and from Maine Medical Center. Um, we have another, uh, another organization that's involved in our presentation today, Ocean Road Cancer Institute, but we will not have a, a presenter from that organization today. Um, before we get started, I would like to go over a few housekeeping guidelines for our session today. Please let's keep this interactive. Post your questions and comments in the chat window for our Q&A and discussion toward the end of the hour. Also, please look for a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording for this session, as well as some um, extra materials and information. Um, also, we really appreciate your feedback. It's important for us to make these sessions better and for our presenters to know, um, to know your uh, thoughts about their presentation. So please do fill out our, our webinar satisfaction survey um, that will be presented to you at the end of the webinar as well. And with that, I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Um, we have Susan Miesfeld from Maine Medical Center and Erin Quinn, who is the Director of Customer Success at Demagi. And with that, I'll hand it off to Erin. Thanks so much, Madeline, and thank you to all of you who are joining us today. Um, we're really excited that you've decided to be a part of this discussion. We think it's so important to talk about the way that we can optimize our mobile data collection systems in order to improve service delivery. So I want to start off today with a little bit of a story taking us back uh, two decades, in fact, to, to when Demagi started and when we started. 20 years ago, um, when we started our work, most of the people who were coming to us we're looking for mobile job aids for their frontline workers. So these are people like community health workers, agricultural extension workers, and livelihood workers. Um, we had organizations coming and saying, I have these frontline workers. What I really want is a mobile tool that's going to help us improve service delivery and help make my frontline workers do their work better. So as time went on, these programs were quite successful um, and the program teams who were implementing these applications started to share their experiences working with mobile data collection and service delivery systems with their monitoring and evaluation departments. Soon enough, of course, M&E teams realized that these mobile tools could also be used for data collection. And in fact, one of the things that they came to realize is that the exact same features that made these applications great as job aids for frontline workers would also help make sure that um, if you use them for data collection, they would collect really clean and reliable data. So flash forward 20 years all the way to today. And what we see is that most of the applications that are being built today are actually created to collect data. So we've swung a little bit to the other side of the pendulum away from our roots of those job aids and like I said, most of them are not only created to collect data, but often developed primarily with monitoring and evaluation needs in mind. Now, part of that, of course, also has to do with um, the importance of evaluation that we've seen, um, you know, just increase and increase over the past two decades, which, you know, is, is actually a really positive thing. But a lot of times what we'll see now is applications that really, really focus on collecting the 20, 30, 40, 50 main indicators um, that the project is going to have to report out on. And so they're focusing on getting that data, making sure it's really reliable, clean, and usable in reports. So I wanna go in and talk a little bit, we're gonna talk about these three teams a lot, the m and &E team, the program team, and the IT team. I wanna acknowledge first off that every organization looks different. So this might not be how your organization um, organizes itself. You might not have these three teams. You might work in a really small organization and maybe you fulfill all three of these roles. Um, you might work in an organization who uh, the, the m and &E team is called the meal team. So 
we're going to go through a description of what we think these three teams are. And hopefully you can find where you yourself sit um, within these three. It might be more than one. It might be just one. And hopefully you can also identify where some of your colleagues sit as well. So starting off with the M&E team, um, as I said, this is the monitoring and evaluation team. It might be called meal, mural, evaluation, measurement. Um, there's a bunch of names that we see being used out there. But essentially all of those teams are responsible for creating the evaluation framework for the project. Um, so they're the ones who are developing the survey instruments and the tools and figuring out how the indicators are going to be calculated. Ultimately, they're the ones that need to make sure that our clean, reliable data is being collected because they are going to take that data and conduct the data analysis, producing any sorts of reports or dashboards that are needed both for internal stakeholders like the program team or higher ups in your organization, and also for external reporting like donor reporting or annual reports. And so their primary goal, their, really, their, their main mandate is to measure how well a project is performing. All of their work is centering around measurement. On the other hand, now we have the program team. They're the ones broadly responsible for the end-to-end -end implementation of the project. So for instance, if this were a maternal and child health project, the program team would be responsible for everything from hiring community health workers to training the health workers, making sure they get paid on time, making sure they have the supplies they need, whether it's plan family planning commodities or iron tablets or what have you, um, maintaining relationships with the clinics that they work with, um, and of course, the application. And so with this really, really broad mandate, of course, comes a lot of responsibilities. Um, and these program teams are often pretty large too. They include the on the ground team who's actually delivering the services, as well as um, the supervisory levels and the project management sort of higher ups. And their main goal is, um, again, very broad, successful implementation of the project activities. And of course, we would also hope of program outcomes as well. Um, and so again, just remember that the app is a very small part of what they're doing, but they're the ones that ultimately um, probably have the most focus on improving service delivery. Next, we have an IT team. And this, I think, is the team that you might be most likely to not have at your organization, depending on the size. It tends to only be larger organizations that have a really robust IT team. But this IT team is comprised of experts in building mobile data collection and service delivery systems. And because they are technology experts, they tend to be sector agnostic, meaning that they could just as easily build an application for a community health program as they could an agriculture program. Because of that, they also rely very heavily on both the program and M&E teams to provide them requirements for the application. And oftentimes when we talk to IT teams within organizations, they say that they kind of act like a tech vendor in that they take their requirements from their M&E and pro program teams and they kind of spit out an application that directly meets those requirements. There's not a lot of back and forth. There's not a lot of discussion and challenging that's happening there. And so of course their, their main goal, the mandate of the IT team is to build a performant mobile tool that meets the requirements given to them by the program and M&E teams. So now that we have a summary of those three teams, let's look at the three most common models of app building that we see organizations use. This might not look exactly the same at your organization, but this is, like I said, what we've seen um, most of the time with, with most of our organizations. So the first model is when you have the monitoring and evaluation team who gets program requirements or who gets their requirements from the program team and then builds not only the survey tools and the log frame and the entire evaluation framework, but also goes on to build that in the application. So again, requirements coming from program team and then M&E team creating the framework and the application. Now, the second model is just a little variation on that. It's still the program team that tells the M&E team the requirements, they come up with the evaluation framework, but then the M&E team gives the application requirements to the IT team and the IT team is the one who builds it out. 
you'll see that the main thread between these first two is that the m and &E team is very, very heavily um, involved in creating the requirements, if not the final application. And if I had to estimate, I would say about 70 to 80% of applications that we see being built are built in one of these two models. Lastly, and kind of the, the least common, but definitely still a model that we see being used is that we have someone from the program team, um, or maybe it's someone who you know, works in a small organization and they wear the hats of the program and the m and &E team, um, but it's the program team person who builds out the application. Um, so it's a little bit more closely related to what's going on on the ground. And I would say that's probably around 20 or 30% of the apps that we see. And so I want to take just a minute and reflect. Uh, I hope that you um, that you don't think this, but in case you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, Aaron's saying that that M and E teams have been building apps, and it's a really bad thing. Not at all. We think that it's great that M and E teams have really taken to mobile data collection tools, and that they are using our tools to collect this really rich, robust, clean data and produce these great evaluations. That is definitely a net positive. We know that data collection is so important and without it, we have no way to track the progress of our programs and determine their effectiveness. However, the one thing we are saying is that by taking this pendulum swing from focusing so heavily on service delivery to now so heavily on data collection, we're leaving some value on the table. Um, we've gone away from our roots of service delivery. We've gone away from looking at how we can improve a frontline worker's job. And we've now focused a little too much on those indicators. So what we wanna talk about today is how we can go a little bit back to those roots and how we can incorporate service delivery into our workflows. So you might be sitting there thinking, what do you mean by service delivery? That is a really broad term and it is. <laughs> um, so as I talked about, mobile apps can be configured as job aids that help them deliver project services. And so features that might fall into this sort of service delivery um, workflow would be ones like this. So potentially ones that help organize and schedule visits. So if I'm a mobile worker, I can open up my phone and right away see, this is what I need to do today. This is where I need to go. This is who I need to follow up with. There are also features that help provide decision support. So whether that is treat adhering to treatment protocol, or you know, getting messages like this mother is exhibiting a danger sign, please refer her to a clinic. You can certainly help your worker as they go about their day um, and guide them into the things that they need to be doing. It of course includes giving targeted counseling messages either directly to the frontline worker to tell them something like, please you know, escort this woman to a clinic or counseling messages that the frontline worker can share directly with the beneficiary, especially if there is some multimedia involved. And we always encourage applications to um, have some engaging multimedia like images, audio, and video. We know that clients really love seeing that and we know that it helps frontline workers as well. And of course, a huge part of service delivery is making sure that everyone is doing their work as well as they can. And so helping supervisors supervisors coordinate with their mobile workers is a really important part of that. This will help supervisors identify issues early on and help their mobile workers so that they're not losing time in the field so that they can course correct whenever they need to. So to demonstrate a little bit more what we mean by a service delivery workflow, I've got a sample here that we're going to run through. Um, this sample project takes place in an Anganwadi center in India. For those of you guys who don't know what an Anganwadi center is, um, Anganwadi centers are all over the country. They are um, run by the Indian government. They serve a lot of different purposes. I would say broadly, they're really centers for community health, uh, but they also run their physical buildings. They run nursery programs in, um, during the first part of the day. And so children come, they receive a hot meal, they receive some take home rations. Um, they get to kind of have like a little preschool day where the Anganwadi workers are actually doing some activities and instruction with them. And then the people, um, the Anganwadi workers that work there also do home visits. Um, they coordinate other community health activities like vaccination drives, 
um, family planning, commodity disbursement, things like that. So Usha is really gonna be the star of our story here. She's our Anganwadi worker and she's the one with an application who is out um, delivering services to her community. Then we have Neeti and Devi who are a mother and baby that happen to um, attend the Anganwadi Center where Usha works and are in her catchment area. If we zoom out a little bit, we have Geeta on the bottom left. She's a district supervisor. So she is Usha's supervisor and also supervises a bunch of other Anganwadi workers within her district. And then at the very, very top um, of the, the hierarchy here, we have Saket, who's a national government official. He sits out of the central government offices in Delhi and he oversees the entire project. So let's look at how we could build a system that really enhances service delivery for all of these participants. So we're gonna start with Usha doing a client visit with Neeti and Devi. She records the baby's weight and height, which auto generates a growth chart. Any time that we can auto calculate something within the application, we do two things. One, we save the mobile worker time. And two, we make sure that they can't make a mistake. I've worked on maternal and child health projects in India and they used to actually have to plot this on a little graph. So having something like this that is auto-calculated is a huge time saver and again, cuts down on mistakes. Another thing that you can do in a service delivery workflow is you can actually directly connect with your clients or beneficiaries. So in this case, the system can actually directly send Neeti an SMS reminding her to come and pick up fortified food supplements for her child. She gets this reminder. She's reminded to come in by the end of the day on 2nd August. And sure enough, she makes sure that she picks up her food supplements in time. If you're a frontline worker like Usha is, one of the most important things when you are very busy and you have a lot of responsibilities is knowing what you need to do, what's the highest priority task. And so when Usha opens up her app, she wants to know who to visit today. She actually can see a list of all the people who are due for follow-up today and not only can she see it, but Geeta, her supervisor, can see it as well, monitor the list, um, and of course be there in case Usha has any questions or is having trouble doing her work. Then Usha is at a home visit now, visiting Davy, the baby, and she hears that Davy has diarrhea. So she's actually able to share a counseling video that talks about at-home treatment for diarrhea. Not only is this a really engaging way for Usha to be interacting with Nipi, um, but it also standardizes the messaging that's going out. We know that frontline workers, you know, certainly are trained and they're very, um, you know, expert in some of the things, but, you know, standardizing that messaging, making sure that the exact same guidance is given to everyone in the country is really important. That was kind of all on the ground. Now let's zoom very far up and kind of look at how someone like Saki, who's sitting at that central level, might benefit from this system. So of course, the first way he benefits from the system is that he can look at his dashboard and view real-time data. Um, so as Usha is doing work throughout the day, Usha and all of her other counterparts within the country, their data is going to the server and he can see it in real time. Not only can he see it, but he can drill down into individual districts and look at what's going on there. So in fact, Saki drills down to all the way to Geeta's district and she, he sees that her nutritional numbers are low. He immediately reaches out to her and tries to figure out what might be going on, see if they maybe need some additional food shipments and he can directly coordinate um, with the district who is struggling. So whereas before this sort of a problem, if we were working with um, paper and pencil or a less advanced system, it might've taken a month or 45 days for us to see that there's an issue with this shipment. Now we can view this almost in real time and fix it immediately. So hopefully that gives you guys a sense of kind of what we mean when we say building systems to improve service delivery. A lot of times I think when we um, start the requirements uh, gathering process for building an application, we tend to have one goal in mind. We think, oh, this is gonna be an app that collects a bunch of data for us, or this is gonna be a mobile job aid. And so we kind of think of them as these two separate things. 
But we know that it's not a binary. In fact, we would say it's the direct opposite. We would say that it's actually quite easy for an application to serve both of these goals entirely, um, that data collection and service delivery naturally complement each other. And we would love to see applications that looked like this that are doing both of those tasks exactly the same amount. Now that's kind of the ideal world, so we'd be happy. And I think what I'm trying to convince you of today is that maybe we can settle on this world. So you might have an application whose main goal is to collect data, but can you add some service delivery aspects into it? Can you pick some low hanging fruit, incorporate it into your app and make uh, the overall program better? So lastly, why incorporate service delivery? Well, first of all, it's important. Um, improving service delivery improves worker performance, client satisfaction, and overall program outcomes. So it has a huge potential to really um, make your project better. Secondly, it's not that hard. A lot of the features that we use that support um, improving service delivery are some of the less complex ones. It's definitely not the most complex parts um, of our platforms that do that. And even projects um, you know, that have already been created for data collection, even if you couldn't redesign the whole app, there are definitely some low hanging fruits of things that you could add in to help your workers out. And lastly, this is maybe a point for um, the BizDev or partnerships folks among us. Making a really robust application that improves service delivery will absolutely set you apart from the rest of your competition. Um, service delivery apps are incredibly powerful and complex. Anyone can pick up any mobile tool and build a simple survey and launch it the next day, right? We have dozens of tools that can do that. But that doesn't set you apart from the rest of the pack if you're bidding on an RFP or something like that. If you can show them that you've built a really advanced application that's going to serve all of these purposes, that will absolutely take you in a totally different direction. And so with that, I'd actually like to um, jump over and, and I'm gonna have Sue start talking about mobile palliative care link. Um, we invited Sue here today because we think MPCL is such a great example of a project that was able to demonstrate that service delivery and data collection aren't mutually exclusive and that they actually complement each other. Um, it's a great example of a project that collected extremely high quality data that was used for research but also delivered some really great service delivery features. One of the things that Sue will tell you guys about is uh, the large consortium team that we had that included several experts from oncologists and clinicians, nurses, local health workers, tech providers like Damagi, I was a part of this project, um, and usability experts as well, each lending their own expertise and making sure that we got out of those silos of program, m and &E, and IT, and we all work together. So with that, Sue, I'm gonna let you go ahead and take on over. Yeah, thank you. Um, and hopefully everyone can see and hear me okay. I'm a medical oncologist. I am at Maine Medical Center in Portland, Maine. Um, I also spend a fair amount of time in Tanzania as a medical volunteer. And the, the idea for this, so I'm a clinician. I am not in the IT end of things. I know data, I know how to collect data, but in terms of analyzing data, that is my, not my expertise. I'm an oncology provider. And the, the impetus for this project that I'm gonna describe came um, when I was volunteering over there at Ocean Road Cancer Institute, which is the government cancer hospital in the country of Tanzania. Um, and when patients are discharged from Ocean Road Cancer Institute, they go home anywhere in the country, and there's very little palliative care that's provided to them when they're discharged. And there were several occasions I was going to join their palliative care team, at least locally, they had a team that went out by van on a regular basis to visit patients, but the two or three times I was due to, to join that team, the van was either, either broken down or it was called upon to do another duty or the team member was sick. So that was my aha moment that, you know, why do we have to rely on a van? Why, how can we use technology to improve access to palliative care? And that was the beginning of MPCL. From that point, I knew Damagi and I was in touch with Damagi and our team began. So next slide. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problem. And for those of you in low and middle resource countries, you're gonna understand this problem. For those of you in the U.S., you will not understand this this problem because we have excellent palliative care resources in the United States and other developed countries. As Aaron said, our team was so important, and our first step was to collect our team together and begin working together. We met at least monthly, remotely, um, to keep this team together. I'm gonna to talk a little bit on the app development because that was very complex. And we don't have, I could spend just an hour on the application development and Erin and her colleagues were critical to developing the app. We did a research study. So this was a Fogarty, NIH Fogarty funded two year study. We actually did a field study of the ultimate application and um, Aaron provided a few screenshots that I'll go through at the end of the talk that show you the interface with the, the different clinical members and patients involved in this field study. Next slide. So what is the problem? And again, those of you in low resource and, and middle income countries um, recognize this problem. Within Tanzania, a single nation in Sub-Saharan Africa, there are more than 20,000 people every year. And it's probably higher because most patients don't make it to healthcare with a cancer diagnosis. But this is the estimate, at least 20,000 new cancer diagnoses every year in Tanzania. And this, is, this number is projected to climb with improved development efforts, namely fewer people are dying earlier of infectious diseases and lifestyle factors are changing as well. And many lifestyle factors are tied with risk for cancer. So again, it's expected that these cancer incidence rates are gonna to continue to climb throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, at least 80% of adults who are diagnosed with cancer when they do present for care at a center like Ocean Road Medical Center um, have untreatable disease. It's either widely metastatic or it's locally advanced or it's a cancer for which they have no treatment available. So if you think about this, this means that at least 80% of those adults with cancer ultimately die of their disease. And they die of their disease at home with little to no access to palliative care. And this is something I've witnessed time and again going out to the villages throughout Tanzania as a clinician, I have no resources. I have no access to pain medications. There's no access to local clinics in these patients. So many of them are dying with very significant symptoms. Um, it's been recognized that end-of-life support is a public health priority. And there have been lots of efforts that have, that have been initiated in countries like Tanzania. The problem is there are very, very, very few palliative care specialists. So who's at the helm? of developing these sorts of programs in a country like Tanzania. Um, and uh, this leaves uh, home-based cancer patients and their caregivers in a tough spot because they really have no access to management resources and they have no means to be able to report symptoms in order to control those symptoms. So this was the problem that I witnessed in, in my years of volunteering in Tanzania. And it was this problem that we developed the app for. Next slide. So the Fogarty project, the study was to, the primary study objective was to develop um, an application that was focused on symptom control with a primary focus pain control, because this is a major symptom that these patients are experiencing. Um, we developed an application that we called Mobile Palliative Care Link, or MPCL. It was aimed at care coordination. So what we tried to do through this application is what Erin described an example of in her component of the talk. We aim to connect this limited pool of specialists with more widespread community-based health workers and ultimately with the patient caregivers so that the tool was meant to, to open communication um, as well as record sharing among those three, what we called our user groups. Next. This was our team. Um, we had a number of colleagues at Ocean Road Cancer Institute that were instrumental in both developing the app as well as, um, as, well as playing a role in the field study. Damagi, of course, on the main medical center and our statisticians were here as well in terms of data analysis. So this gets to Aaron's point that um, that the M&E team can be anywhere in the world with an application like this. And then um, 
we had a usability expert um, in the Boston area who was instrumental as well. Next slide. So in terms of background, um, with my link with Demagi, Demagi has a software program that allows for the development of an application like ours. Um, it's accessible on a computer via a, a web browser or on smartphones and tablets. The importance with a country like Tanzania is it has both online and offline data collection capabilities. So if someone loses their power or does not have access to internet, we can still collect the data. And then when internet is, is available, it uploads to the, to the server. Um, again, this was built as a shared platform, our application with separate interfaces for the three user groups, the oncologists, along with their nurse specialists that were at Ocean Road Cancer Institute, the local health workers that were in the larger Dar es Salaam region. Dar es Salaam is the largest city in Tanzania, and that's where Ocean Road Cancer Institute is. So we partnered with the, with the local health workers in the greater Dar es Salaam area, and then, of course, patients and caregivers. Another critical part of the team that Aaron mentioned, but I can't express the importance of this individual enough, um, in terms of bringing teams together, we all speak different languages, um, not Swahili versus English, but I'm an oncologist. I know very little about the development of an application. I know a little bit about data collection and analysis, but I am not going to be the primary person. So we each have our own you know, work language, and the human-centered design expert really understood each of our needs and allowed us to work together. Um, the application we developed in both Key Swahili as well as English based on the needs in Tanzania. Next slide. So this human-centered design person, again, for anyone who wants to build an application like ours, I, I, I can't stress enough the importance of this person. Um, we had one individual, he is a technology person, but he also understands the user experience with technology um, and has been involved in technology usability testing for a number of years now. Um, and at the outset, we defined the user groups and he was instrumental in us understanding the needs of each of those user groups. And throughout our study, he was involved in doing usability testing at each of the steps in the app development. And, um, it was a thorn in Erin's side, not one that she let us know about, but every time we did that usability testing, we would go back to Erin's team and say, you know, we've got to tweak the app. And Erin's team was awesome at doing that. So again, I can't stress this enough because you will not have a usable application unless you build that process into the development. Um, we actually had two rounds of usability testing. One of those rounds we visited Ocean Road Cancer Institute and did the usability testing face-to-face. -face. The other we did remotely. Next slide. So team coordination, I already mentioned this. We built our team at the outset. We had an awareness of what our needs were gonna be, knowing what the goal of the application was. Again, this usability expert was central to all of this. We involved our local team here who did all of the statistical analysis early on so that any of the surveys we built as part of the study she was part of so that we understood the needs. Um, and we met at least monthly as a team um, by, a, by a Skype at that point in time. And that's instrumental as well and get and making sure we're all moving in the right direction. Next year. So our study, this again was a research study um, funded by the Fogarty Institute of the National Institutes of Health. Um, there were two phases to this study. The first phase was the actual development of the MPCL application using this user-centered design methodology where every step of the way we address the needs of the individual users, including our research team relative to the surveys we wanted to administer, as well as the data we wanted to analyze at the end. And then once we went through that one-year process of developing the application, we did a field study um, in partnership with colleagues at Ocean Road Cancer Institute, this study involved untreatable cancer patients being discharged to home. And they were at discharge, they were randomized to two arms, and I'm gonna get into the study in a little greater detail. 
Um, we use both qualitative and quantitative methodology. And again, this was all done through Ocean Road and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and the larger Dar es Salaam area. Next slide. So at the core of this, the, my primary concern was pain control, quite honestly, because I, I, I witnessed the ravage of pain in cancer patients in the smallest villages throughout the country. So my primary goal was um, pain control, but we used about, we tried as best we could to use validated instruments throughout this study. And at the core of the application um, is the palliative care outcomes scale. This is, this was developed in Africa, has been validated in Africa, and it's designed to assess symptoms throughout a patient's end of life care. Um, and this is the actual survey that was sent to patients. We sent it to patients twice a week um, and collected response. So this was the core of the application was number one, choosing an instrument that we knew had been validated and number two, administering this to patients on a regular basis. Next. So this is, this is um, the design of our study and I won't spend a lot of time with this, but um, after phase one where the application was developed, it went through a lot of usability testing, adjusting, and then by the year, end of year one, we began the field study of the prototype that was developed based on that, that um, one year period. The first 10 patients, we, these were our pilot patients where we were tweaking the system, tweaking surveys, et cetera. And then once those 10 patients had completed study, we went into the larger study where a total of 90 patients were enrolled, half of them were in the intervention arm, which is which was they were provided the MPCL application. The second arm I'm going to describe next, but this was our two-year project um, and, and the layout of that. Next, Erin. So the, the study itself. So this was an IRB st approved study. It was approved both um, locally in Dar es Salaam as well as nationally. Um, Again, at the core of this was a test of the MPCL application for POS reporting. The two study arms, this is really important to recognize, the two study arms were one arm, half of the patients were sent home with a smartphone um, on which the MPCL application was uploaded. The control arm, um, we did not feel it was ethically appropriate to send the the control arm home with, with no link to care. So our way around that was actually the POS was administered twice a week on the same schedule as the intervention arm, but it was collected by one of the specialists at Ocean Road Cancer Institute. So essentially it was phone contact for POS, POS reporting. And importantly, if there were symptoms, that clinician took care of those symptoms. So it's important to call this out because it was not a true control arm. The user groups, again, were the patients and their family caregivers, the specialists that were linked with the research nurses at Ocean Road Cancer Institute, and of course, the local health workers in the greater Dar es Salaam area. Next slide. So this is how NPCL works. So where the star is, that's where we begin. So the cycle begins, and for these patients, the cycle began at discharge. So we collected the initial POS, the, the symptom control, or symptom assessment survey at discharge. And then it was administered to these patients remotely um, via MPCL once they got home. And the way that, that this was triggered was the patient or the family caregiver got an SMS message saying, time to complete your POS. The POS would be completed. It would become available to both the local health worker and the specialist team. If everything was fine and symptoms were well controlled, it was left at that and the next survey or the next POS would be di distributed to the patients again um, the second time that week. But if there were symptoms that were of concern, um, the specialists and local health workers were able to communicate with each other. If the patient needed a visit, the local health worker would do that. And again, there was a means to share records and to communicate between the local health worker and the specialist to intervene to address those symptoms. And then the whole cycle begins again. We continued this for um, up to four months for our study patients. Again, the control, quote unquote, control arm was getting contacted twice a week for collection of POS items. 
Next slide. Um, so as measures for this research study, we collected sociodemographics, clinical information, and that initial POS at discharge. And then again, we followed these patients up to four months, during which time we were collecting POS responses twice weekly. Um, so that was the primary core of this study to see if POS responses um, were different between the two study arms. We looked at the app usability. So there was a six week survey built into the application among all the user groups assessing how usable the application was. There was an end of study phone survey of care satisfaction and it was done by phone because we actually collected the study phones to be able to use them for other patients. So at this point in the study, the patient did not have the study's phone. We also did extensive usability and utility assessments. And the most important was we did one-on-one -on -one interview with the clinician users at the end of the study. So these were the things that were measured and have been reported on in subsequent publications. Next, please. So data analysis, um, we looked at the most important thing to us was the attitudes and beliefs about the MPCL application, because this field study was not meant to be a randomized controlled trial where we were going to be able to compare the two groups. So really, the goal of this study was to assess the application's usability and utility. Um, we did look at differences in baseline characteristics in the trajectory of POS scores throughout the study, as well as the end of life, I'm sorry, the end of study um, care satisfaction survey comparing the two study arms. But importantly, the phone contact arm really could not be considered a control arm. Next slide. So um, in terms of the outcomes of the study, what we found was that every user appreciated having the application. They felt that the application was relatively easy to use. We did get some suggestions for change through those final interviews. We did look at the comparison between the two study groups. Um, we did not see a difference relative to average POS scores over that four month period. Um, and the, the reasoning behind that was number one, there were some differences in the clinical characteristics of the two arms, whereas our look at the types of cancers in the control arm um, they were not as aggressive as the type of cancers that were in the MPCL arm. And again, the control arm was being supported clinically throughout the study. But again, in general, the, the outcomes were similar comparing those two arms. So here's a glimpse of what MPCL looks like from the different user groups. Um, again, we had patient fair family caregiver, we have the study nurse who was paired with the specialist at Ocean Road Cancer Institute, but the study nurse actually helped us to run the study. So they were responsible for making sure surveys were collected, et cetera. And then the local health worker was using the application as well. So these are the menus. I'm sorry, I'll just go back for a second. These are the menus of different tools that were made available to these different user groups. And they were different depending on that user group. Next, please. So um, this is just a, a screenshot of that reminder that went out to the patient twice a week um, for them to complete the POS. It sometimes took a little bit of prompting. If that patient did not complete their POS, they actually received a phone call and it was collected by phone. Um, next slide. Um, this is, this is um, another great part of the application that we built into it, thanks um, to one of our grant reviewers. Um, we built into it an educational resource that we use common symptoms among end-of-life cancer patients. And each of these different categories, we built a simple educational resource relative to confusion or constipation or diarrhea or appetite changes, et cetera, and means that patients could simply assess what was going on and manage those symptoms at home. Next slide. Um, so this is, this is what was available to the patient. So this is their view of their application um, report. The POS is, is the green icon um, that allows them to access the POS and complete that survey. They're, the second is the educational resources I just talked about. 
we felt it was critical that these patients be able to connect immediately to their clinical team. So we actually had immediate links to phone contact for both the specialist as well as a lo local health worker and the nurse. Um, and that could either be through emergency phone contact or through SMS messaging. Next slide. The specialist was able to try the primary goal of this application again was to track symptoms. So the specialist had an ability to track the trajectory of a patient's symptoms over time. Um, there were red flags sent out. We used a level of four or greater at that point. We sent out this exclamation red flag to the clinicians, letting them know that the patient's symptoms were pretty significant at that point in time. So that this was the view that they saw. And at those points, that was typically when they connected with the local health worker as well as the patients to intervene. Next. Here's a local health worker. Again, they can look at the record. They can look at the POS. They can look at messages from the specialist and communicate with the specialist and have the same view of the POS as the specialist does. Um, and they worked very closely with the specialist in adjusting medications based on specialists input um, and also feeding back to the specialist at points when they went out to visit the patient. Next slide. Um, so the nurse and the specialist local health worker, it was a three-way means to communicate um, and actually to access the record. We actually built a, a mini electronic health record into the application just so that the specialist and local health worker could keep track of that patient's medical record. And then we had means to also allow those two groups to track any changes in clinical status within the application. Next, please. So results, lessons learned. I already went through the results. I'm not gonna spend time on this slide. Um, and the challenges we met in doing this. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this, Erin was awesome and her team was awesome because anytime we found we needed to make a change to the application, we would turn to their team. And there were a lot of suggested changes. I think when we went to Africa for the usability testing, we had about 150 application suggested changes that all went to Erin and her team. And obviously they weren't gonna be able to, to address all of those so that we tiered them and and her team took care of the most urgents. Um, we held on to the others for after the study. Um, understanding the data collection and interpretation. So the data was dumped into ComCare and that all had to get to the analyst here at Maine Medical Center. And there were some glitches in her getting a lot of that data. It came as a huge import. And so to be able to call through that and find the data that we needed took a little bit of of work and um, direct connection with Demagi team, including Erin and others on her team. Um, as can be expected, and many of you should be thinking, how did the training go on the use of this application, both among the clinician users as well as the patients? We did find some difficulties in training these user groups, although they were not insurmountable. Um, some of our patients had never had a smartphone, but their family caregivers did. So that was something that we expected and we did experience. Um, in terms of implementation, if a patient had their own phone that um, was an Android device, we could upload the application to their own device. But then we had the SIM card that we had to deal with. So there was a lot of, we had to bring an IT person on early on in the field study to support the use of these devices and providing the devices to patients um, and continuing to bird dog those devices throughout the field study. Um, there was a, a, another question that I would ask as a clinician, remember it built into the application were emergency phone calls to the clinicians. And at the outset, we worried a little bit that the specialists were gonna get inundated with phone calls. And there were rare occurrences where individual patients push that phone call um, button very, very frequently, including, you know, we were doing this over the holiday, the Christmas holidays, including on Christmas Day, there was one specialist that received about six different phone calls from one patient, and they were not urgent phone calls. So this is important. We don't, we don't want to overburden the specialists um, or the local health workers. So we, we tweaked that as well and, and adjusted the wording to make sure that the patients understood that those contacts were meant for emergency only. Next slide. So um, 
just kind of summarize the results again. I, the differences in POS response to the trajectory over time, again, we did not see a major difference between our two study arms, but quite honestly, we did not expect to based on, on the control arm. Um, and again, differences in both socioeconomics as well as clinical um, characteristics of those patients. We are taking MPCL now um, and planning a larger randomized study throughout Tanzania, working with the other two cancer hospitals. We're in the midst of um, trying to find and securing another NIH grant to do this. Our hope is that we continue to succeed with this application and can take it to other countries as well. Um, Major issue remains availability of specialists as well as availability of, of some control medications, including drugs like morphine. And these are things that we've had to work with the Ministry of Health and the clinical teams to be able to support that component of this particular program. Next. So I've already mentioned all of this. The other thing we're doing is um, there are a lot of emerging technologies that and, and Aaron mentioned this, that once you build an application, it's possible to add to it and improve on it. So we are actually looking at new and emerging technologies, including wearables, where we may be able to continuously track a patient's symptoms, chatbots, so a means to be able to support the patient without necessarily needing to engage the specialists or the nurses. Um, so if it's a simple question, we may be able to use chatbots to address those needs. Um, so a lot of work still going on in this application. Next. Great. Thank you so much, Sue, for that um, and, and for that wonderful explanation of, of all the work that you guys did um, on that project. I have four really quick recommendations we wanted to share with you guys, and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A. So hopefully um, between what Sue and I have said today, you're a little bit inspired to go back and reevaluate how you can incorporate service delivery into your mobile data collection systems. How would you start to do that? So first and foremost is you need to familiarize your team with service delivery features. A lot of times, especially program staff, don't know what features exist or they don't know how to use them in applications. So you can highlight apps that other teams have built that do these well in order to make people familiar with them. Next, as Sue talked about, you know, the, the MPCL team met monthly with everyone all around. Schedule regular meetings with members of all teams present, even if you don't normally do this. And on those meetings, make people give updates and invite questions. Oftentimes we feel like we shouldn't question someone from, you know, who am I to question a clinician or, an m and &E person, um, but inculcate this culture of curious questioning because you'll get a lot of different perspectives when you do that. Next, understand your users. And this was such a huge part of MPCL. Um, it was wonderful that we were able to actually have a usability expert work with us the entire time. But even if you can't have a usability expert, um, put in the time to do extensive user research, not only in the beginning creating user personas, but as you go along, budget in time to continue to update the application on that um, and continually focus on the question, how can I make this user's job easier? And lastly, and perhaps most challengingly, um, find a way to incentivize all of your teams to improve service delivery. You can see when we were talking about program m and &E and IT in the beginning, the program team is really the only one with a natural incentive. So look at how you evaluate your teams, look at how you measure their performance and incentivize them and find ways to make each team accountable for their own uh, part of how they play into the service delivery of a program. And so with that, I'm gonna have um, Amy from, from Damagi come on and she's gonna lead us through some of the questions that you guys have been submitting. Awesome, thank you so much, Erin and Dr. Sue. That was fantastic, um, really, really enjoyed that. Um, You've been asking a handful of questions in the chat, so I'm going to go through those. Um, but I'm also, uh, as I'm speaking, we're going to put up a couple of poll questions for you. So um, feel free to answer those at your leisure. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. The polls. The polls are up. So these polls will just essentially give us information on if you would like to hear more from Demagi um, through our newsletter, or if you'd like to talk to anyone about Comcare. Um, we would love to chat with you. So first question that we have, and I believe this one is directed mostly towards Aaron. Um, this is a question from Jenny. 
And the question is, you know, what tool is being used for the dashboard in the example? Um, is this a separately developed Power BI dashboard linked to ComCare data? Yeah, um, I'm actually, I believe that that uh, might have even been a custom dashboard, but most of the time what we do is we encourage folks to take their data from ComCare or from whatever data collection system they're working with and integrate with a BI tool like Power BI or Tableau. Sometimes um, organizations will actually, um, you know, you do their own analysis in SPSS or somewhere else, but it's typically Power BI and Tableau that we see people using to create these really pretty dashboards. Awesome, thank you. And the next question is from Philip J. Um, and this is a question for, I believe, both Susan and Erin. Um, but what was the scale of the development team working on developing and tweaking the app that Dr. Susan presented? Erin, I'll let you take that. that sure. Was... So from, from the, the strict IT perspective, it was four of us at Damagi. So uh, myself and two other people with really similar backgrounds doing primarily like application building and development. And then another colleague of ours at Damagi who kind of transcends the, the m and &E and the IT worlds because she's actually um, also a researcher but works primarily with technology. So that was the, the pure tech part of us. Um, I guess Bob kind of transcends that as well, the usability expert. Great. Um, and then one last question, and I realize we're just about at time. Um, last question is, I think for you, Dr. Susan, which is, how did you go about choosing ComCare for this particular project and program? And I know there's a lot of tools out there. Um, how did you make up that decision? Um, it was more the link with Damagi. I, I had an association with, make sure I'm not on mute, I'm not. Um, I had an association with Damagi beforehand. So it was more Damagi, and their software, then finding the software first and linking with the company. Gotcha. Um, and then we've got one last question since we've got one minute um, from Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, which is what qualities, qualifications do you think were most important for the user experience consultant role? Um, experience in, in working with different user groups. Um, I, I personally know the, the, our colleague who did this and his experiences, he is an engineer in human factors um, and has spent his life as a qualitative researcher. So again, someone with tremendous experience, both speaking to the user as well as speaking to the developer. Thank you. And um, there's one question that just snuck in, which I'd love to address if we can, um, from Marie Therese, thank you. Um, which is, how did you manage disagreements between the IT team and the M&E team slash um, PM on what requirements were feasible or not? Yeah, so I can take that. Um, like Sue said, we they came back from Tanzania with just a, a novel's worth of feedback for us, which is great. I mean, we, we love that the users were so forthcoming. But essentially what you do in that sort of a situation is you say, how much time do we have to dedicate to these changes? And then you look at that list and you say, all right, what are, what are the most important things? So first let's rank that list, what's most important. And then second, let's look at how much time it would take. So if you're looking at something that's medium importance, but super easy to do, that probably makes the cut. If you're looking at something that's medium importance and will take five weeks to do, that probably doesn't make the cut. And so um, as, the, as the, I guess, an IT team person, we really went back and we said like, okay, here's the amount of, of time that we have, and here's the amount of time all these tasks are gonna take. You guys tell us what's most important. So it's, it really kind of was, I don't wanna say it was simple. I'm sure, I'm sure three years ago, we didn't think it was simple at all. Um, but it's really just a negotiation of, of, of making people prioritize what is the most important. And I'll, I'll add here, um, there, and, and NetHope is going to provide these, but there have been a number of publications as a result of this work. So we're happy to provide those citations to you as well. And much of the development is, is included in those papers. So, and we're here as, I'm here as a resource. I know the MIG is as well, if anyone has interest in a similar application or experience. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Susan and Erin. That was fantastic. I think we got through all of the questions. So. Um, back to you, Madeline, if you want to close it out. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, 
Uh, thanks for sticking with us for just a few minutes longer today. To the audience, thanks for your, uh, attending today. Um, this was a, a chock full uh, presentation. And I want to um, shout out and thank uh, Dr. Miesfeld and Aaron and Amy from Demagi for taking time to bring this information to our audience today. So a um, couple quick things. Please do um, take a moment to complete our webinar satisfaction survey and let us know what you thought. And we will be following up with an email that will include a link to this recording so you can sh watch again, watch later, share with your colleagues. And with that, I'll say thank you again to our presenters and I wish the audience a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for inviting us. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.